Look, I understand the kids don't use change anymore, but I don't care. We're gonna talk about how to design piggy banks and how they can be made flippin' awesome now because of 3D printing. The main issue is that if you don't have the plug in the bottom and you drop the coin in the top, it falls right through the piggy bank and out again, so you really don't want that. The other thing was is that you had the piggy bank and then you had the piggy bank. And there really were not very many options on that if you wanted anything else bank related. Traditionally, they're too big, chunky, and complex to use things like injection molding because they have too much material and are often so thick that they cause shrinkage. So you end up using a real version of rotational molding, which is fine because nobody has to see the inside. But by using a molding process, you end up having to create this really hollow interior structure to where as a child, if you are trying to get coins out of the bank, they are going everywhere but the hole in the bottom of the piggy bank. You're shaking and you're hoping that luck smiles upon you and the coin travels through space inside the bank and hits the hole just perfectly for a dunk so that you can get your quarter back from it. So we wanted to go ahead and solve this. Get more animals so that you could do what else you wanna do. Make the bank more interesting, more reliable, but at the same time, make it more enjoyable to use. So the first thing we're gonna do is design it with a sphere in it, with a slot in the top and a hole in the bottom. We are designing this whole part to be basically a negative of what the interior will look like. This negative can then be inserted into the 3D model files of the animals we showed you earlier, and then you can create these new models really easily. That design of this interior part is to scale and exported from CAD software. And in fact, we have it available over on Angled if you wanna make a piggy bank yourself after this but it is the right size for an ideal size piggy bank and then you just resize the animal around it so that you can remove it. But here's the real twist. It's not that hard to make a plastic part with a big old cavity inside of it. However, what we did in order to make this way more interesting is that there is a small ledge inside of each one of these piggy banks going diagonally across here, which prevents any coins from falling straight on through. But it's just a ledge, it's a simple ledge. So it catches the coins, so you have the fantastically satisfying thunk of the coin going in, even if the bank is empty. But then if you wanna get your coins back out, you just kind of tilt the piggy bank and then they fall out of the slot on the side. So it's a really good way to improve the piggy bank and this ledge is impossible to manufacture with any other process. In order to get that same ledge in a traditional type of bank, you would have to assemble something. You'd have to have a right half and a left half and the ledge in behind and you'd sandwich it together. You just tripled the amount of effort, design and cost from just Oh, here's your model, cut out the interior, and let's go. 3D printing is able to create those internal structures that do things that nobody else could ever do. So now we have designed that perfect piggy bank interior to where coins fall through, but they land in the bank and they give a satisfying sound. So each time you earn, you get feedback, like a ding on the phone, only it's something useful. And then if you wanna get your coins out, you can because the whole structure allows it to fall out and flow out straight to the hole. And we have sourced with another designer who has more expertise, all kinds of cool animals so that now we have all kinds of skews of nifty new creations that can serve as piggy banks. We have very easily created an entire product line of new piggy banks that are fully differentiated from any other piggy bank, not only in more selection, but in capabilities and satisfaction. And since they're printed, they're able to create a really nice cohesive look and texture and feel to them that's the same as other piggy banks. Now, all you have to do is plug in the Etsy app to our print farm, upload these files to each one of your listings, and you are in business having just designed designed the product. Dyson fans are really quite interesting devices. They don't have blades and yet they're able to move quite large amounts of air. And the reason they're able to do this is from a number of really interesting engineering solutions that they've created. But this system has some trade-offs. It is much more expensive to manufacture than just a standard propeller. With a standard propeller, you have a mold for the propeller and then you shove it on the front of a motor and then you're done. With the Dyson fan, what they actually have to do is stamp an inner ring that is the airfoil and then stamp or mold the outer ring that contains it all and lets the air flow through it. And then they have all these other other components inside that are controlling airflow and that kind of thing. So it's a very complex mechanism. But this is also why a Dyson fan would be ideally produced with 3D printing. 
3D printing has a number of key advantages. First of all, if you have multiple components, you're able to design them so that they're able to be printed all at once. Rather than having an inner ring that is cast or stamped and then an outer ring that is molded, you can instead just have the single vein with holes and internal channels print it, which is great because you've just eliminated all that assembly, all that extra processing and all that extra design to design for each one of those individual processes. Now, here's the other thing that's interesting. When we designed our Dyson fan, we made it a little bit simpler. We're not going for a $500 or $700 fan. We needed something that we could make in a day to prove out the concept. So what we did is we got a basic centrifugal motor that is actually used for inflating an airbed, and we designed an internal cavity around that so that it can be shoved up into the bottom of this. The outer side is a basic cylinder so that it looks nice and we proportioned it with respect to the veins so that it looks decent. This is a decent enough fan to where you could have it inside the house. And it looks interesting. It doesn't look like a fan. The veins themselves, we have some channeling inside of here that splits the air from that motor into these two veins. It then comes up into two slots inside of here to where it can blow out. And then on top, we designed airfoils. Airfoils that allow the air to follow along that and ideally in train, drag along air through here. So that as the air is flying quickly over this airfoil right here, it's able to drag more along with it. And you know, for a first shot that was built in 24 hours, it works pretty darn well. And it demonstrates all kinds of nifty capabilities with 3D printing. Dyson is able to manufacture their fans, but they're not really able to do it super affordably, which is fine for their brand because they're a premium brand, but they aren't able to really create something that's really mass market. This fan could be modified and have the extra bit of engineering done to it to make it really effective and useful. And this would be a really cool piece that could be mass produced. You could plug into a print farm like ours here at Slant 3D to produce thousands and even up to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these without having the upfront cost of molds or all the tooling or having to do all the engineering of a hundred different parts that Dyson had to spend millions of dollars to do to get their bladeless fan. But it's also just a really cool concept because the airflow dynamics of bladeless fans is just interesting in general, even if you're not interested in manufacturing itself. So first of all, let me just say that a birdhouse is a terrible product, but with any terrible product that is totally commoditized to where you can buy it for a nickel, there's an opportunity to create a new product that is way more compelling and way more interesting. And with 3D printing, that is now possible. So it is possible to produce a birdhouse with mass production 3D printing. The scale is there, but how can you actually utilize it? Well, let's go ahead and just look at the traditional birdhouse, the normal design that's a box and a roof that everyone has seen hanging around in their grandmother's yard someplace. This design is not very manufacturable with 3D printing. It was designed to be put together with boards and balsa wood and sold for a nickel. So let's take this a step further. You have 3D printing. You're able to create any geometry you want. Well, what is most different from a square box birdhouse? A round one. Why not make something spherical, make something bobular? You can make a perfect sphere that looks like the Death Star and put a little hole in the front of it and let the birds live inside of that. You have so much more creativity than what has been, ever been possible before. And you can even see examples of this out in the world. Inside of the 3D printing community, people have made bird houses and designs that are completely unique and far more detailed than could ever be manufactured traditionally, but can now be manufactured for the same cost as the old balsa wood models. So use that. Inside, you could put internal furniture and have some fun. If you were really going into the product design, you might wanna make a birdhouse that's like IoT enabled with a small webcam on it so that you can see inside with the birds, which is really easy to manufacture with 3D printing. The possibilities get so much more open. So we went ahead and did this. What would be the impossible design that doesn't really come out very often? Well, it turns out one of the most basic designs is wood. What if you want to make a birdhouse that you don't really have to look at, that isn't loud and ostentatious? You can make a birdhouse that looks like the trunk of the tree, and you can make it merge and look like some wart or a knot hole or anything else. And something like this is basically impossible to manufacture any other way because it has really thick walls and a complex texture. And we added even a secondary texture to it. And we made it two stories so that you can have a couple families inside of there. And it doesn't stick out in your yard as a large, ugly, piece of lawn furniture that fades over time. 
you mount it to the side of the tree and you can move on with life. 10 years ago, if you wanted to make a birdhouse, you would have to get molds and or buy some lumber yard in China and have them produce a thousand of these things and then you store them for forever and hope people buy all your birdhouses. Now, all you have to do is create a design, make sure that you're making it manufacturable and then upload that design with some photos of the final printed product when it comes out. And then when somebody makes an order, that product can be printed and shipped directly to that customer customer and you never have to deal with upfront cost of tooling and machinery and that kind of thing. And you're able to create impossible geometries with great insulation so they protect the denizens very well and can blend in in a way that was never possible before or stick out in a way that was never possible before. You can create capabilities that had never existed and could never be made before. So there's now a chance to make a common and basic product way more exceptional and create new companies around it. So today we're gonna to talk about how to design a minimalist pour over coffee maker for mass production 3D printing. So this coffee maker is a very simple design. It's a simple curve, but even though it is a simple design, there is a lot of subtlety within it that is really educational about how to design a product. Number one, it is a coffee maker, which means it comes into contact with coffee. Generally inside of 3D printing, we recommend combining as many parts and pieces as you possibly can, because with printing, you can. You can turn complex assemblies into single monolithic parts. But here in this case, we want to make sure that the product is good and sustainable and long-term. So using a third-party part is fine. This main filter at the top that then can hold your paper filter is the way to add a little splash of metallic to it, but also in improve the functionality of the part. Now, this is a minimalist maker, which means we wanted to use as little material as possible. Again, 3D printing gives us a huge benefit because you have all of this hollow feature over here on this side that has a very low infill of about three to 5%. That lets you use very little material while still having good structure and a good proportion. Because if we made this like super thin, it would just look weird and wonky. This chunky style, while still minimalist, makes it look like something robust and something reliable that you can have around. Around. So when we designed it, we wanted to, again, make sure it was strong and reliable and didn't have any sort of supports. Now, on a lot of times on this channel, you'll see us say, I'll print it just like this at an angle. That way you don't need support. But that doesn't really work in this case because we wanted this rounded outer shell and this beautiful texture and all the rest of it. So we had to print it on its side. When printing a part on its side, it's important to be aware of the bed surface. So this part was kind of led along in its design to have this really kind of sharp chamfered edge that comes down to almost an eighth inch wide seam. This means the bed surface doesn't really impact the look of the part because the bed interface spot is so small because it's this little seam over here and this little seam over here, you can't really tell the difference between the top and the bottom. In the bottom, there's all of the kind of design accents that we did of, yes, the beautiful curve and you have the detent in the bottom for the cup, which implies that's where you place your cup. But let's go ahead and talk about the top right here. Again, this is being printed on its side, so you have to be aware of the overhang. You don't want to have a seggy top and you don't want to have any support. With this first prototype we did, we actually have kind of a rough side over here compared to the smoother side on the bottom down there. That's less than desirable, but survivable for a lot of products if you're doing kind of small run stuff. And that can be addressed a little bit in post-processing. But if you were going for full print on demand, it is best to have design support inside of there to make sure that it's as tight and beautiful as possible. Now, looking at these teeth, these teeth come in from four directions. Now, normally something pointing down at an angle like this would need support itself. But what we did with that was actually create these overhang supports underneath here and chamfer them so that they come to a point, but at kind of a weird oblong angle, which is then mirrored on the bottom so that you can't really tell that it was intentional. Otherwise you would have, I don't know, some chamfer at the top and then normal spikes down at the bottom and it would just look weird. But by creating the symmetrical geometry, you're able to get the points that set the filter off from the printed part because when this is plugged into the top, wherever this touches the plastic, water and surface tension is gonna pull liquid that direction, which means you could get leaks around the side of the hole rather than around the tip of the filter. So having those points and having those points guide liquid down, make sure that all the liquid goes to the point of the filter so that you have a smooth flow that's not really contacting the part. And of course, as far as texture, we went and added just a little bit of noise to it to make sure that it looks really beautiful. And we use this wonderful kind of terracotta color that just looks nice for a minimalist thing.
The first real golf tee was patented in 1889 by, oddly enough, a couple of Scots named William Bloxham and Arthur Douglas. Their first tee was not what you would traditionally recognize as a modern golf tee. It was basically a stand that sat on the ground. And while it wasn't a modern tee, it was the first one to be patented. But it wasn't until about 30 years later that the modern golf tee took shape and was patented by a dentist named William Lowell. This is exactly what you originally recognized, which is a stake placed into the ground with a cupped upper surface. But what if the golf tee or a similar object was being invented and manufactured today? What would the process be? And would you actually be able to mass produce an object as simple as this with 3D printing rather than what you might traditionally expect? What you would first want to do is with 3D printing, you want to maximize surface area. You want as much strength in the skin of the part as possible, which means you want to create something fat, but it is a stake. It has to go into the ground. So so it has to be very easy to press into the ground so it can't have a large cross-sectional area. You can't have a railroad spike going into the ground. It just doesn't work. It's uncomfortable and no one will want to use it. So you start out with an overall outer area that you want and then you can cut it and rib it in in order to make it reliable. And then of course you put a dish into the top of it so that it's able to hold the ball. And on first draft, you would end up with something like this. This is the optimum 3D printed golf tee. Notice how the outer ribs are very wide and as far out from the center of the tee as possible, but since it's cut out almost like a tent stake, you do not have a large usage of material and you do not have a large cross-sectional area, so it's very easy to press into the ground. And of course, we made the impression on the top just right to fit a golf ball. But what is optimal about this is that this can actually be printed in the optimal orientation for a 3D printer, which is on its side. That way, all of the layer lines are moving lengthwise of the axis so that this part can be reliable and strong and not necessarily break after every tee off. So is this the way that golf tees should go? Well, that's a question up to golfers, but this is a demonstration of the scale of 3D printing. If you design for the process and you create a product that uses that process in the appropriate way, which you have to do with any manufacturing process ever in, in existence. Machining is different from molding, is different from casting, is different from printing. But the advantages of printing are that you do not have maximum quantities. You're able to change your design rapidly and and you still have a, the same or better scale than traditional manufacturing processes. It allows you to create something that is truly unique and competitive and can stand apart from what has been around for a hundred years. So when designing your next product, make sure that you consider the current state of the art and the technologies that are available because you might just be able to create something completely original. Have a great day, everybody.